Okay, so how's everybody this morning? I got a message this morning that um, I want to share that's been on my heart. Um, a lot of times I, the things I'm going to talk about this morning are things that I've actually had to go through and live through, and I've often asked the Lord, do I have to live every sermon that I preach? And he said, would it be impactful if you didn't? And I said, probably not. So when I'm talking about being stretched this morning, I've been stretched in every single area that I'm going to talk about this morning, and I just want you to know that it's okay. It's okay to be stretched. It's okay to be pulled in different directions. What's not okay is to quit. What's not okay is to quit. So let me start with this. So we all have goals or targets in our life, um, goals that we want to reach, big goals, little goals, big targets. Little targets, God has given us all these goals and targets to reach in our Christian walk. And one of the things the Lord was telling me this morning when I was praying over the sermon was, are you focused on your goals or are you focused on someone else? It's hard to focus on the calling and walk and will and destination that I have for my life if I'm so focused on what somebody else is doing. It's hard for me to get to the place God is calling me and allow him to stretch me in areas of my life that need to be stretched if I'm too concerned with what you're doing. Let me just be honest with you guys. I don't care what you do. Your relationship with God is between you and God. It has nothing to do with me. You can cry on my shoulders. You can tell me everything you want. I promise you I'll take it to the grave. My brother took some things to the grave. That's just what we do, right? We're loyal. We're men. We're women. When we confide in each other, we got to keep it confidential. But your relationship with the Lord is between you and the Lord. I can lead you, I can guide you, I can pray with you, but ultimately you make the final decision. But I will say, nothing is more irritating or struggling than to counsel somebody for weeks at a time and they just turn right around and jump right back in the ditch. And the Lord says, how many times have you done that to me, Timmy boy? I say, okay, Lord, okay. But, so as a young boy, David, the eighth son of Jesse, who later would become king, trained and trained and trained with a weapon, a sling and a rock, so one day he could fight a giant he didn't know existed. Your training and the things that you're, go you're doing now while things are calm, your study time, your prayer time, um, your perseverance, your faithfulness, you're not quitting, you're not giving up, you're not backing up, it's preparing you for things in life that you don't even know exist yet. And I said this all the time, that everybody is a one phone call away from a totally different life. And I've had probably about seven of them phone calls in my life. So just get ready. Um, in Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17, Goliath was a giant human. But the giant you're facing today may not be in human form. Your giant may be cancer. Your giant may be a wayward son or a daughter. Your giant may be uh, an eviction notice or financial hardship. Your giant might be an addiction to alcohol, drugs, or even pornography. So hear me this morning, church. I need you to understand. I need you to look at me when I say this. Your addiction does not define you. Your financial hardship does not define you. Your lost and broken children do not define you. You are defined by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the call that you have on your life has nothing to do with your children or your circumstances. Although he will use your circumstances oftentimes to get you where he wants you to be. But I want you to know that you are defined by God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. The same guy that created the universe. He's not bound by the universe. The guy that created the computer isn't inside the computer making everything work, right? God created the heavens. He created the earth. He created the galaxies, the stars, the moon, the sun. Everything he created for us, for times and seasons, he's outside of that. The creator cannot be bound by the created. And I just want you to know that he has a plan for you. He has a purpose for your life. He can take you from the guttermost to the uttermost, church. I'm telling you, how many times has he done that in my life? Taking me from the bottom of the barrel, from the guttermost to the uttermost. He'll take your... Uh, your trial and turn it into a testimony. He'll turn your pain into a praise. He will turn your hurt into a hallelujah. Sometimes I think we just need to shout and scream, hallelujah. 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 I remember when I, was in, uh, when I was in prison and we were coming out of the chow hall, there was, a, um, there was a fellow Christian guy, and every day he would walk out at like 4 o'clock in the morning because we had first call for eating. And he would come out and he would scream at the top of his lung, Hallelujah! 
And everybody would say, shut up. <laughs> quit saying that. But he never quit. He never quit. And I'll never remember, forget what I said. I said, why do you do that? He said, man, sometimes you just got to let it out. You may be locked up. You may be bound up. But sometimes you just got to stand up and scream hallelujah. Doesn't matter what you're going through. There ain't no valley deep enough. Ain't no mountain high enough. You can still have enough energy to scream out hallelujah. Amen. But sadly, many of us don't prepare for anything. And when the giants show up in your life, we miss the target because he wasn't ready. So what's my point? Are you preparing for what's to come? Because Jesus didn't say if the storms come. He said when the storms come. He didn't say if you pray. He said when you pray. They're coming, church. I'm telling you right now, they're coming. So if you're not preparing now, you're going to suffer later. The winds of change are blowing. At first, it just seemed like this calm breeze, but there is a gale force wind sweeping across the, this nation, sweeping across all the countries right now uh, in this world. And if you're not ready for the wave that's about to crash over us, you're going to get swept away. So let me say this real quick while we're talking about changes that are coming. Are y'all paying attention to what's going on in the world? Are you paying attention to the wildfires and the earthquakes? Are you paying attention to the tsunamis? Are you paying attention to the things that our governments are doing? Are you paying attention to what the other countries are doing when they're threatening nuclear strikes and sending out bombs? The whole thing about prophecy right now is everybody is trying to get Israel. Pay attention to what's happening in Israel because that's where God's time clock starts and that's where it ends. Let me tell you something. In 2017, when Donald Trump declared Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, everything broke loose. Now look, let me just be quite honest. I don't like Donald Trump as a person. I like what he did for our country. I did vote for him. I would probably vote for him again, and I own that. You don't have to like it. It's okay. You are who you are. I will also say this. Jesus was neither Democrat nor Republican, okay? So let's just quit looking at the way other people believe and judging them and not talking to them. You vote your conscience, and you vote for the Bible, 100%. But the problem that we're having right now is Israel. We have uh, Russia. You have Iran. They're wanting to come in and take control of Israel. And the reason they're wanting to take control of Israel is because during the winter, Russia is locked down with their, with their navy because their water's frozen. If they control Israel, they have a place, a warm water port for all their battleships, right? Iran's the same way. But I don't want you to forget about the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. So the moment that Russia and Iran and China step foot on Israel, there's going to be a, a thunderstorm of hellfire and brimstone of the likes we have never seen. Watch Israel. And what's going to draw these countries into Israel is the oil, is the natural resources. Once Israel gets energy independent... They're all coming for them because they have the warm water ports, they have gas, and they have oil, which gives them access to our country, the United States. And they're coming. It's not if they're coming, it's when they're coming. So we need to pay attention to the things that are going on in this country and quit watching CNN for God's sakes. Just my opinion. The winds of change are blowing. And we're being stretched. We're being stretched in every way, we can be stretched. And the things that are happening in our leadership and our government is disgusting. I would never imagine in my life we would be fighting the things we're fighting. It's absolutely a shame. So the title of my message this morning, as I've already said, is Stretched. And I want you to look for a moment uh, at your life like it's a rubber band. Your ability to be stretched or your ability to be flexible you cover more ground when you're stretched. Do you agree? Um, you, your ability to return back to normal place. You're, you're, the farther you're stretched back, as a, the farther you can go. So the more you're stretched, the less flexibility you have. And I, I'm trying to picture this in my mind for the way the Lord wanted me to put it. But your, your uh, stretching is a season. That's what I want you to know. Stretching is a season. Not every season has to be a hard season, but we are all right now in a season of stretching. Our finances, our children, our schools, our government. You can only go forward as far as you are stretched back. And if you're not being stretched all the way, you won't go forward all the way. And so I say, Lord, stretch me. 
I know I'm the weird guy that prays for these things. Lord, stretch me in my faith, Lord, so I can be a better Christian. Uh, Abraham was stretched when God told him, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. It was more than just a sacrifice. It was more than Abraham just sacrificing Isaac. Isaac was the son of promise. Isaac was the one that was going to bring forth the, uh, all the nations. It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God changed Isaac. Then you have Jacob. God changed Jacob to Israel because Jacob means deceiver. And so now we have Israel. Then we have the 12 tribes. That's where all of that falls into place. And Isaac was the son of promise. He was the one that we labored for. He was the one that um, was spoken of by the angels. Moses was stretched when he, by faith, led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. Could you imagine the walls of water in front of you, standing there? And I'm going to talk on this for just a moment because a lot of us are at this place. If you could just picture in the, in the, uh, the imagination of your mind, over two million Israelites coming out of Egypt, standing, looking at a sea in front of them, mountains on both sides, and the enemies behind them. Now, how amazing is God to put you in a place where that'll happen? And it may not be a literal Red Sea for you. It may be a mountain of debt. It may be uh, infidelity. It may be an addiction. It may be alcohol. It may be pornography. It may be something in front of you that you can't get past, but you've got mountains on both sides and you can't go back. You know that you can't go back. And so God tells Moses, use what's in your hand. Stretch out your hand. And he stretched out the rod that was in his hand and the sea parted. Could you just imagine being them people standing there trying to have faith and they had enough faith to believe. And I don't know if the children actually had faith or if it was Moses' faith or if they just had no other choice but they trusted and they believed. And over two million people crossed the Red Sea. And then here comes the enemy. Don't ever <laughs> underestimate the power of God. Here comes the enemy. They come running right after him, and they assume that the same blessings that were handed down to the Israelites will be handed down to them. But little did they know, once they, once they got in the middle of the Red Sea, the walls came crashing down. And people used to say, oh, that ain't real. That ain't true. Look at your science. Look at the history of what's going on. Guess what they're finding at the bottom of the Red Sea now? Chariots. Shields. Bones, where did those come from? Hmm, the Bible talks about it, right? Through and through. Just imagine being there and getting on the other side. Amen. By faith, Moses crossed the Red Sea with the children. They had two choices. Go through the Red Sea or die at the hands of the Egyptians. Sometimes we have to make a choice, church, that we're going to move forward even though we can't see what's around the corner, or we're going to stay in the same position, and I say this all the time, nothing changes if nothing changes. If you want change, if you want your life to change, if you want your circumstances to change, sometimes you got to get out from where you are. The definition of, of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. If what you're doing now ain't getting you the results you want, then change. God doesn't change, but we have to change our methods. But the problem I think we have is we have too many choices. God will eliminate your choices one by one to get you to a place where he, you will either choose him or choose Satan. Choose light or choose darkness. Choose to be free or choose to stay in bondage. But either way, Joshua chapter 24 says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Who are we really serving? Do we talk about a God we don't know? Are we wearing a cross representing a Christ that we don't believe in? By faith, the walls of Jericho fell in Joshua chapter 6. God gave Joshua an unusual strategy. If you've read the story, you'll know, you know what I'm talking about. And God will give you things to do that are unusual so he gets the glory. So often during the Bible where we think that God's going to send, and they have oftentimes went in and fought with swords and shields, but so many times where we think God's going to send the armies in to annihilate the enemy, he does silly things that don't even make sense. But who gets the glory, right? When we do things and go through trials and things in our life, who gets the glory? Do we do it for our own glory or do we do it for the glory of the Lord? Everything that we do as men and women of, of, of God and Christ should be a direct link, a path pointing someone to the cross. 
Remember, I said last week, we're just a journey. We're so horners, so joiners going through this earth. Our destination is heaven. It's not here. And we're trying to take as many people with us as we can. We're not taking any of this stuff with us, by the way. But by faith, the walls fell in Jericho. He told Joshua to have his army march around the city once a day for six straight days. And while they were marching, the soldiers played the trumpets. And the priests carried the Ark of the Covenant. Hear me, church. Everybody in the body has to be involved. We have no bench warmers. We have no seat warmers. Everybody in the body has to be involved. Everybody in the camp, in the Israelite camp, had a job. They had a duty. And they all did their part. And what made them successful is the ones that had this little part over here wasn't trying to tell the ones how to do the part over here. And I'm going to say this the politically correct way. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Don't worry about my lane unless I ask you for prayer. And I'm not going to worry about your lane unless you ask me. And we'll all get along to get along. I guarantee you if we're all pushing on the same cart in the same direction, we'll get there a lot faster than if we're all pulling. Everybody pulling in a different direction. Everybody has an idea and a thought and, and a way that I should be living my life and the way you should be living your life. But what matters is what God said. Sometimes we're going to do things that don't make sense, that are unusual, that doesn't look right. It didn't make sense for them to march around the city of Jericho for every day, for seven days actually, but for six days, one time a day. I can only imagine. What would you be thinking? Like, really? Another one? Another lap around? And let me get this straight, this straight real quick before I move on. The reason the Israelites stayed in the desert for 40 years, for so many years, is because they kept making a lap around the mountain. Every time they don't get it right, guess what God would say? Take another lap. And around they would go. And he does the same thing to us. The lessons that you need to learn, the things that God's trying to teach you, if you don't get it on this lap, he's going to send you back around. Think I'm playing. Look at your life over the last 10 years. How many times are you coming circling back to the same exact thing over and over and over? Nothing changes if nothing changes. Y'all hear me? Sometimes God will ask you to do things with the natural eyes that don't make sense, like build an ark. It made no sense to Noah. And most people don't realize this, but it never rained until after the flood. So when God came to Noah and said, I want you to build an ark, first of all, what's an ark? Second of all, what is rain? It's never rain. Remember, Genesis says the earth was watered from a mist from the ground. So no wonder people thought he was crazy. But he knew what the Lord told him. He didn't waver. And people say, the Lord don't speak to me. And I would say respectfully, if you were quiet long enough, he might be, you might be able to hear what he's saying. He speaks to all of us. And that was the conversation I had with the Lord just a few months ago. He's like, you're not listening. Many of us listen to respond. We don't listen to understand. So we need to get quiet before the Lord. But let me get back. Noah built an ark. And I love the story of Noah. And he built it in faith. It didn't make sense to the people around them. Everybody could have got on the ark that wanted to get on the ark. It wasn't just for Noah and his family. But everybody laughed at him. Especially when he said it was going to rain. They didn't even know what that was. So on the seventh day, going back to Jericho, the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. And at Joshua's order, the men let out a powerful roar and, the, and Jericho's walls fell to the ground. Who would have ever believed it? Who would have ever believed that was the, the way God was going to win Jericho for them? They had never seen that kind of stuff happen before. And that's why people did not receive Jesus, because they had never seen the kind of miracles that Jesus performed. It was about the law. And they shouted a powerful roar. And Jericho's wall fell to the ground. I wonder this morning, church, if we could take a, a roar break. Huh? I just want to know. Can y'all roar? How loud can you roar? You think you could, you could scream loud enough to knock these walls down? I'm going to wait. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to see if y'all can do it. Ready? Y'all looking at me like I done lost my mind. <laughs> but I have. 
right? All right, on three, I want you to roar. One, two, three. Roar! Okay, like, that was okay, but I think we could do better. I want the children's church to come running down here thinking the rapture done happened. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Roar! That is what the Israelites did. And so when you got walls around you, and you don't know where you're going, which direction you're going, just stop and roar. Just stop and roar and say, I know you got me, Lord. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm coming from. But I'm going to stand where, you, where I'm at, and I'm just going to trust and believe, and I'm going to let out a hallelujah, even if it don't make sense. And that's what they did. But they went, they got so arrogant and prideful, they went to the next city, Ai, and got their rear ends handed to them. So be careful when you let start roaring about God and walking in pride and pomp because he will humble you. Amen. Um, I want to make sure that we understand that we do everything in God's strength and not ours. So I'm going to read uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 32. Hebrews 11, 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets who, through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, people became valiant in battle. They turned to fight the armies, they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better re resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in des deserts and mountains, and dens and caves, and the earth. These men... Were stretched. These were the men's of men of faith. They were stretched in every which way possible. And the reason they were, or we are still talking about them today, is because they persevered through the stretching. They persevered through the stretching. They kept their eyes on the prize. They kept their eyes on the prize. They were stretched even unto death. We talk about uh, being martyrs for Christ. We talk about men and women that die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we talk about, oh, we suffer for Christ because we can't, you know, we may not have AC in our building or our church is small. We're suffering as Christians. Woe is us. We are not suffering. None of us is suffering in here for our faith right now. When's the last time you were legitimately persecuted, you were flogged, you were beaten, you were sent to prison for your faith? Not us. I believe that time's coming sooner than later, but not right now. These men of faith, they went through all of this. And so when I pray, uh, the Lord reminds me when I read this that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So all these men of faith that went before us, they had weeping, they had, but the joy came. Even though they died, they had a greater reward. Amen? So I say, stretch me, Lord, in my finances. So let me tell you something um, about finances. When you start paying tithes, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get a flat tire. <laughs> True story. It always happens. I can't explain it. I don't understand the, uh, the warfare behind it. I'm just telling you, when you make the decision to start doing something with your pocketbook, Everything breaks in your house. Your washing machine, your air conditioner, um, your kids need school money. It just happens. So when you start paying your tithes, you're going to be stretched. And I have always, could always find a reason why we can't pay our tithes. And I say, why can't we look for a reason why we can? And the reason it was so important to God about that, the reason it was so important to the Lord. And it wasn't so much about your finances. It was about your heart. Because in Matthew 6, 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God knew if you would trust him with your money, you would trust him with anything. And I say it all the time. He can do more with 90 than you could ever do with 100. So where is your heart at? 
But let me also say this. It's unpopular. It's an unpopular opinion because it's preached from behind the pulpits that if you withhold your tithe from God, there's people and angels sitting in heaven with a checkbook saying, oh, he didn't pay his tithes. Let's go flatten all of his tires this week. Oh, he didn't pay his tithes this week. Let's go, you know, break his car down or let's break the refrigerator in his house. That's not true. God wants you to give your tithes and offerings, but it, he's not going to come down and destroy your life. Out of it, look at the woman with the might. Look at the, the, the boy on the cross that died with Christ. He wasn't baptized. He didn't tithe. He didn't give any offerings. He didn't even go to church. He didn't even have a church outfit. All he knew was Jesus was Lord. So yes, I'm telling you, it is scripture, it is law to give your tithes and your offerings. But don't be, do it out of fear. Because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give your money out of fear thinking if you don't, God's going to ruin your life. Because it's not so. He cares more about your heart than your money. He cares, he, he cares more about you feeding your children than your money. I'm going to say it. There's been months as a Christian is fired up for Jesus Christ that I didn't have money to pay my tithes. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I went and bought groceries instead of giving to the church. I know that's not popular. Does that mean I don't trust in God? Does that mean I don't have faith? Absolutely not. What do you think God would say? Y'all can take what you want from that. You can be mad at me. You can send me nasty grams. But that's just where I'm at. I do not believe the merciful God who sent his son to die on the cross for my sins is sitting up in heaven watching to see if I'm paying my tithes or my offerings. It's important. It's scriptural. I encourage you to do so. There's a law of, of seed time and harvest. There's a law that you reap what you sow. Let me move on before I never get asked to come back. <laughs> Anyways. But you may have to sacrifice some things. You may have to sacrifice some things in your life so you can pay your tithes and offering. You may have to buy stuff from the grocery store. You may have to eat a little more at home. You may have to buy off-brand groceries. I'm going to read something out of Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 8. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 8. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you come out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face, and they shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. What does all that mean? What does all that mean? It means that when you're obedient to God, he blesses you. Above and beyond what you could ever think or imagine. He's going to stretch you at first. It's a stretch when you have to give of your finances, when you already don't have finances, when the price of groceries have increased three times more than what it has been. It's a stretch. But God understands. He knows and he's, he, he, he loves you regardless. But we do make sacrifices. He doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. Will you give it to him today? I get it. It's really hard to give when you're broke. When I first started out as a new believer, I didn't have nothing to give. I was so broke, I couldn't even pay attention. Y'all know what I'm saying? Like, really? <laughs> the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 12 and 13, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things 
through Christ who gives me strength. So one of the ways that you'll be stretched uh, moving forward in your ministry is by going through some things, right? We all have a story. How many of you have lived an absolute perfect life? One? Two? Yeah, I see. Okay. <laughs> Y'all remember in the, the Ten Commandments when it says, Thou shalt not lie? <laughs> all right? Okay, I'm not going to call out any liars, but it is on film. So, one of the ways you'll be stretched in ministry is going through some things. We all have a story. A lot of times, our story or our stretch is what leads us into the ministry we're in. Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of those who are in Christ Jesus and called according to his purpose. And I say this to people all the time. The things that God brought you out of, when you wonder, well, what is my ministry? What am I doing, Lord? What have you called me to do? Well, look at the things that he brought you out of. Was it suffering, struggling uh, uh, with pornography? Was it addiction? Was it alcohol? God's going to lead you oftentimes right back into the same places to pull out others. You look at the disciples. He brought them all out from the fields, the boats, fishing, tax collecting. And where does he send them? Right back into the same places he brought them out. Those are our areas of ministry. Those are our stories. Sometimes telling people about... Uh, Jesus, they're going to shut down. They're not going to listen to you. But when you start telling your story, they're going to listen to you. And when you tell your story about how, how God redeemed you and changed your life and opened ways for you and made a way when there seemed to be no way, and you don't have no other explanation but God, they're going to listen to you. They will relate more to you and your story than what the Bible says, right? And then later you can slip in some scriptures. Like I, I like to call them J-bombs. Slip in the, J, the Jesus bomb, you know, and then next thing you know, you're having a full-blown conversation with someone about Jesus who said they wanted nothing to do with him. All because you're sharing your story. Because that's the, when you get pulled out of something, God's going to send you back into the same place to pull others out. And when we're being stretched in our ministry, it's hard sometimes because God's trying to get us out of our comfort zones. How many of you have been sitting on the seats Year after year and doing nothing. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm just saying. How many come to church every Sunday, check your box off, and go home and live your life? You don't think there's more? Do you not think there's more to this thing we call church? Fellowship, faith, hope, love. He wants us to level up. He wants us to dig a little deeper. But we have to stop making excuses we, and realize that we are where we are in ministry because that's where God put us. Paul says in Philippians 3.13, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. When you're reaching for something, you're being stretched. And what you're learning now is preparing you for what you will be. What's stretching you now will be what takes you to the place that God wants you to be. Here's what God showed me about using a rubber band. I said, Lord, I'm being stretched. How much more can I take? How much more can I be stretched in every area of my life? There was a time in my life when I was going through deal, uh, some things where my wife was sick. I had a full-time job. I was preaching at the church. My kids were hurting. I had a crazy mother-in-law fighting against me. Uh, it was crazy. Everything in my life was stretched to the max. And I said, Lord, how much more can I handle? How much more can I take? And he said, the farther I stretch you, the farther you'll go. And it's true. If you stretch a rubber band, it'll only go as far as you pull it back. And I said, Lord, I want to go to the ends of the earth. I want to go to the places that you called me to go to. And so stretch me as far as you have to do. And God said to me, the farther you stretch back, the farther you will go. The harder the pull, the harder the stretch. So when you're hurting, when you don't understand what you're being stretched out or why you're being stretched out or why you're being pulled back so hard, it's because God's trying to take you somewhere. Get that in your mind. God is trying to take you beyond the seat you're sitting in. He's trying to take you beyond the 30-second prayer you pray as you're running out the door drinking your protein shake. He's trying to take you beyond the one scripture a day that you're reading so he can have a relationship with you. Revelations 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, 
I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And what he's saying is I want to have fellowship. I want to have supper. You don't sit down and dine with people you don't like. So the fact that Jesus wants to dine with us says he loves us. He adores us. He's died for us. He wants to have a deeper relationship other than when we need something. Might as well call him Santa Claus. It's a true story. We usually only go to God when we need something. Hardly ever do we go when we're happy. We don't need God when we're happy, right? If I got money to pay my bills, what do I need God for? And there might be a reason why you're always being stressed. Maybe you need to change your mindset. Maybe you need to change your mindset and say, I need God, I need God to even wake up in the morning, to even walk out of my house. Amen? So in order for you to get where God wants you to be, he has to stretch some things out of you. Stretch the doubt out of you. He has to stretch the unbelief out of you. Stretch out the insecurities out of you. He has to stretch out the anger and the bitterness out of you. And stretch the hurt and the abuse that you've been through. He's going to stretch it out of you. And if you allow the stretch, God will take you to where you need to be. It hurts. It's painful. But every time you think about how hard you're being stretched, I want you to never forget this message. And remember that Jesus' arms stretched. As far as the east is from the west, from one side to another. So when you feel like you can't handle any more, remember what Jesus stretched out across on that cross for us. And we can handle it because we can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Maybe you're being stretched in your marriage. Maybe you're fighting over money because there's never enough. Maybe you're fighting over responsibilities over the children. Maybe you're fighting over the past with old flames, or, or you're being stretched. I can, I can especially see if you're being stretched if only one of you are a believer. Why on earth would you ever want to marry an unbeliever? Why would you do that? You're not going to change them. I'm just saying. Husbands and wives have been blaming each other from day one. From day one. When Adam, when, when, what did Adam say when God asked him about eating from the tree? What did he say? Eve gave me the fruit. My wife gave me the fruit. The woman you gave me, oh God, it's her fault, it's your fault, but it's not mine. Don't we do that? And we always look to pass the blame instead of owning the responsibility. I get it. Life is busy. You have kids, after school activities. You have church and work. Um, your marriage is always being stretched. You know what would make your life easier in the stretch of your marriage? Let me give you one word. I always remember. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Your both of you, realizing that life is busy for both of you, understanding that compromise is valuable. You don't always have to be right, men, women. You don't always have to be right or have the last word. Just because you don't agree with your spouse don't mean they're wrong. A little bit of compromise, a little bit of sacrifice will go a long way in your marriage. Be patient with one another and realize that we're all on a journey that we're created different. I have different needs and desires, and, and God speaks to me different as a man than he would my wife or my bride. He speaks to her different. And once we understand that and recognize that, we, have, we can have an amazing marriage. But if you have the mindset, I'm always right, you're wrong. When you get married, you become one. You become one with your wife. We all said the same thing at our weddings. I promise to love you for better or worse. We do good with the better part, don't we, church? But in the stretch, when things are not so good, we tend to forget that part of our vows. That we will love you in the worst. Wife, are you trying to lord over your husband? Are you trying to lord over your wife, husbands? If so, you're missing the mark because the only one who lords over the marriage is God Almighty. And if you're working and making him lord in your life, instead of you being lord, you're going to have an amazing Marriage, I promise you. Will you honor your vows if your spouse gets sick with cancer? You want to talk about being stretched, for better or worse. Your, com your commitment to your spouse don't change when things are bad. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female 
And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So we have grown in a culture that says marriage is 50-50. But the only problem with that is when you're not given 50%, your marriage is lacking the 100. I've always said it's 100 and 100. So if I'm falling short of giving 100, my spouse will give 100. So there's always 100 in the marriage, right? And can we talk, can we talk about marriage for just a minute? Can we get down into some theology here? Some nuts and bolts. Marriage is a covenant. How were covenants made? In the Old Testament, covenants were made through the act of consecrating the marriage. And what would happen is they would go to the mother-in-law's house. True story. They would go to the mother-in-law's house, and they would covenant their marriage. The guy, the male, would enter the woman. He would press through the, this uh, uh, veil in her body called the hymen, and it would bring forth the blood, which let the mother-in-law know, the family know, she was a true virgin. And therefore, this marriage is holy, and a covenant has been made. And what the male does is he enters into her and enters into the sanctuary of her womb, which is the Holy of Holies, which is where life is created. You follow me? Now you fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the bridegroom, and you are the bride. Are y'all tracking with me? Okay, I know it's deep. I know it's hard, but just follow me. He says, I am the bridegroom, and you are the bride. So when Jesus died on the cross, he brought forth the blood. The veil in the temple rent in two, and you can now enter into the holy of holies. So that defines the marriage as husband and wife. It defines the marriage from the bride, groom, and us, the bride, in Jesus Christ. So we no longer need a high priest to go into the sanctuary. For God, we can go ourselves. We can enter into the holies of holies. But the problem is, the problem is, myself included, we have made covenants all over this city. Come on, I didn't hear no laughs about that because you know I'm right. And we have soul ties. We have made soul ties with people that we were never meant to make soul ties with. Because for everything holy, everything that God created holy, Satan has created a counterfeit. Including marriage. But I want you to know, and I have had to do this myself, regretfully, I've had to pray and ask God to break these soul ties that only the Holy Spirit can break so that when I do get married, I can be pure and holy for my bride. And it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to go to the, look, you don't think God knows? You think he's going to be mad at you for saying, Lord, help me. I need, you know, I need you to deliver me and break these soul ties. He already knows. He needs to break them. Did y'all understand the, the picture I was painting about the marriage? And that's how it's going to work. That's how God designed it. Amen? But the problem is that we are making covenants with people we shouldn't be making covenants with. I'm just saying. We've got to stop. The only way to stop is just stop. Just quit. Quit going to places where you know covenants can be made. Unless it's a holy covenant. Unless it's a holy matrimony covenant set in place by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not worth it. I'm telling you, it is not worth it. And I'm guilty of it. And I'm not ashamed to admit my failures. Y'all know I'm an open book. I don't always talk about about it, but most of you know me and know there's two versions of me. Pre-Jesus and post-Jesus. Amen. And the way you talk to me or address me in the conversation determines which version you get. Amen. You... Not everybody can handle the, pre- the, uh, the post-Jesus. They still need a little of the pre-Jesus, right? I'm just, anyways. It, it, it made me laugh. I'm sorry if it didn't make you laugh. I thought it was funny. You may be stretched thin. Mama, you're my biggest fan. You know that? You always have been. You may be stretched thin. Your marriage may be stretched thin. Your finances may be stretched thin. But let me tell you something. It ain't broken, church. It's okay to be stretched. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to need. It's okay to fail as long as you get back up. What is not okay is to lay down and quit. It's not okay to stop. It's not okay to throw in the towel. 
and it might be, you might be stretched to your limits. Your forgiveness might be stretched to its, to its limits. It's hard to forgive people that have hurt you. But again, remember, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for people that he knew would never believe in him. If he can forgive them, why can't we forgive our dads, our fathers, people that have hurt us, our children who ran away or, or, or live in wild and reckless lives and abusing us? Why can't we forgive those who have said bad things to us? And we walk around with these coats of bitterness, and they weigh us down. And we want to come to church on Sunday, put a mask on and say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and walk right out the door and forget everything we learned and start getting down there and gossiping and telling everybody how bad that person is. Can't you forgive them? I know it's a stretch. I've been stretched to have to forgive lots of people in my life. But hear this as I get ready to close. Stretching is a season. Listen to me. Stretching is a season. If you're being stretched right now, know that it's almost over. That doesn't mean you won't be stretched again. That doesn't mean that if you don't get it right this time, that you won't be stretched again in the same area. Like I said, you'll make another lap. You'll go back around the mountain every time, many times until you get it right. It's not... If you're not stretched all the way, you won't go forward all the way. And, and hear me on this. Sometimes we, we, the stretching is because of unnecessary things that we've done in our life, like lying. Sometimes we're being stretched because of things that we've done, like lying. I can't stand a liar. Just tell the truth. Why lie? Because it leads to more lies. And it leads to more lies. Know this, sin will always take you farther than you want to go, and it will always cost you more than you want to pay. David started off King David. It was a time when men went to war, and he should have been out on the battlefield. He should have been out in the, where the warriors were, fighting the battles that God set before him. But instead of doing what he was called to do, he was home, relaxing, a little folding of the hands, a little sleep, a little slumber. You know, Proverbs says, and, and the thief will come in. And he looks out of his balcony, and he sees this woman. And he asks of her, he asks, hey, who is this woman? And they said, oh, it's your servant Uriah. It's his wife. So what does David do? As the king took her she got pregnant then he tried it started he should have been where he was on the battlefield then it turned into adultery then it turned into lying then he had his servant uh, tried to deceive him to bring him into the fold away from the men's army but his servant Uriah was loyal and said I'm not going to enjoy my wife I'm going to sleep at your foot David because my men are out there fighting. And so once he couldn't deceive him, he sent a letter through the hands of Uriah back to the captain and said, put him in the hottest battle so that he can be struck down. And that's what happened. All because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Adultery, lying, deception, and murder. But have no fear. God will send a Nathan in your life. I say, you are that man. You are the one that did that. Can we close our eyes this morning? I said the story about David because I just felt like it was important that we have an understanding that we have a call and we have a responsibility as men and women. We have a place that God has positioned us to be in. And we need to arm that station. We need to be where God told us to be because when we're, when we're not doing what God's called us to do, there are ramifications for that. Other people are hurt. I want to ask you this morning, as, as you were listening to the sermon, what areas of your life have you been stretched in? I would almost say that we could all raise our hand for financial stress. It's hard, church. It's hard to keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We're being stretched every which way we can. Even our schools right now 
the things that they're allowing in our classrooms, the things that are going on at the, at the highest places in our world, in our governments, in the embassies, and in the palaces. It's all being stretched. It's all being, it's all leading us to a place where God's trying to take us. And if we could just step back, learn what God wants us to learn, pay attention to what's going on with the times, I think our stretching will be less invasive on us. So let me ask you, with nobody looking around, get that thing in your mind that you're being stretched. Whatever it is that's stretching you, I want you to pray a bold prayer. You probably think you know what I'm fixing to say, but I want you to ask God. Say, Lord, stretch me more. Stretch me as far back as you can stretch me so when I move forward, there will be no doubt I will never return to this. Stretch me as far as you can stretch me in my finances, in my marriage, in my home, with my children, in my job, in my faith, Lord. Stretch me to a place where I make reading and studying a priority and not a second thought. Let my first thought be, Lord, when I wake up, good Lord, good morning, Lord, not good Lord, it's morning. Father, I pray right now as we're we're in our minds, we're seeing the things that have stretched us beyond where we think we can handle it, Lord. I pray that you give us wisdom, Lord. Help us to get through this, Father God. Send out your favor. Send your hand of mercy. If it's something we've done, show us, Father God, so we can repent and ask for forgiveness and move on, Father God. Just We want to thank you, Lord, that your promises are yes and amen. We want to thank you for your mercy when we don't deserve mercy. We want to thank you for your grace that you pour out upon us, Lord, even though we don't deserve grace. It's unmerited favor. There's no reason for us to be here. There's no reason for us to have the things we have or the relationships that we have, Lord, except by your grace. Thank you, Lord, for stretching us. And I pray the areas in our life that are complacent, that are dormant, that you will stretch us, Lord. And always always remind us, Father, to stretch on the cross. As Jesus was laying there, looking into the eyes of the centurions that were nailing the nails and stakes into his hands and his feet, who were mocking him. having the power to call down legions of angels in a moment's notice. His grace kept him on the cross for us. I never want to end a a message without giving an opportunity for you to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And I always think, yeah, I think everybody looks like they're saved in here. But just in case... I don't want to mix any messages. I don't want to get anything twisted. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to look. Nobody else is going to look. It's between you and the Lord. Uh, The important thing is that you get saved. The important thing is that you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior because the way this earth and this country and this world is going right now How would you, why would you want to live without Jesus? He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who is and was and will forever be, the Almighty. He sees you in your weakest. He sees you in your best. He sees you in the morning. He sees you in the evening. He said before you were born, he knew you in your mother's womb. He has every hair on your head numbered. And that is a God I want to know. So I'm going to close my eyes. And I'm going to ask you, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, or if you want to rededicate your life and rededicate to be saved, nothing else, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior or you want to get saved, right now with nobody looking, just raise your hand and let's all pray the same prayer. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for forgiving me for my sins. 
and giving me newness of life. I love you. Surround me with Christians. Help me to walk in your ways all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whether you did or didn't, can we all just praise the Lord this morning?